Good morning, everyone. My name is Councilmember Rafael Espinal, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm joined today by my colleagues on the committee. We have Peter Koo from Queens, and we have Justin Brandon from Brooklyn. In today's hearing, we will hear testimony on Councilmember Brandon's bill, intro number 1657, that looks to prohibit street vending on certain streets in Diker Heights, beginning on Thanksgiving Day until New Year's Day. Street vendors are crucial to the fabric of New York City. Adding vibrancy and diversity to the retail and food landscape. They also contribute markedly to the city's economy. Although data is hard to come by, a 2012 study concluded that the direct effect of street vendors could be estimated to be more than 16,000 jobs, $78.5 million in wages, and an $82 million economy. Uh, street vending is also a vital source of income for many people, especially newly arrived or long-term immigrants. Traditional brick and mortar outlets are typically cost prohibitive for people entering the market, but street vending offers an entrepreneur alternative and an avenue for economic independence. Despite their benefits, street vending in New York City is also contentious. As the most densely populated city in the country, street and sidewalk space in New York is a rare and valuable commodity. However, Vending is usually not a problem in predominantly residential neighborhoods that lack foot traffic. An, except, an exception to this is Diker Heights during the holiday season. It has become a tradition for residents of this neighborhood to adorn their homes in festive lights and decorations. The event has become so popular over the last few years that it now attracts a whopping 150,000 visitors each season. And with these crowds, of course, come the savvy street vendors, keen to capitalize on the increased foot traffic. Who can blame them? While we admire the entrepreneurial spirit, we have to make sure that the residents of Diker Heights can still go about their regular day-to-day -day activities. Unfortunately, we have heard numerous complaints about food trucks blocking driveways, vendors operating illegally, increased garbage, and fumes and pollution from vendor trucks and carts. For this reason, Intro 1657 seeks to establish street vending restrictions in parts of Diker Heights during this particularly busy time. We look forward today to hear from the administration, Diker Heights residents and businesses, as well as street vendors themselves, about their recommendations regarding this bill. Before we begin, I'd like to invite the bill sponsor, Councilmember Brandon, to say a few words. Thank you, Chair Espinal, uh, for hearing this bill today. Uh, when most people talk about Christmas in New York City, they'll usually mention the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, the holiday windows at Saks, or maybe the Rockettes at Radio City. Meanwhile, some 14 miles from Midtown Manhattan, there's a magical place in Brooklyn that puts them all to shame. For decades, homeowners in Diker Heights have decked out their homes with spectacular Christmas light displays. In recent years, this uniquely local hometown tradition has gone from a small Christmas time stroll around the neighborhood to a world-renowned must-see destination, attracting hundreds of thousands of tourists onto the narrow residential sidewalks of Diker Heights for about 40 days starting in December. Starting the day after Thanksgiving, the Diker Lights fanfare begins anew, widely publicized on social media, radio, and every morning TV show from here to Germany as the thing you absolutely must check out this holiday season. Over the past few years, as the chair mentioned, savvy charter tour bus companies and private commuter vans discovered a very big money-making opportunity and flooded this otherwise quiet residential area with busloads of visitors from Long Island, New Jersey, and overseas. Brooklyn was already a scorching hot tourist destination, so the Diker Lights sightseeing packages quickly exploded in popularity. But local residents who, for so many years, have loved viewing the Christmas light displays now feel completely overwhelmed by these tour buses that bring hundreds of thousands of tourists and a parade of ice cream trucks and street vendors that combine to cause a traffic congestion Christmas nightmare. This creates a month-long street festival-like atmosphere in this otherwise quaint residential neighborhood. Just imagine the joy of a 40-day unofficial street festival happening outside your door on a quiet tree-lined block or the noise and fumes from an idling ice cream truck for 10 hours a day. It's not exactly the Norman Rockwell Christmas of your dreams. Over the last few years, local leaders have joined together in an effort to get a handle on all of this. After dozens of public meetings and outreach to local residents, last year Community Board 10 applied to City Hall for a street event permit, hoping to bring some order to the event while prohibiting the illegal vendors that overwhelm the neighborhood. 
But NYPD, uh, the law department, NYPD, denied the application, they argued, because they could not issue a permit for an event that technically took place on private property. They compared Diker Lights to tourists visiting Times Square to see the billboards. Naturally, Community Board 10 contended that Diker Heights is not Times Square, and as one of the safest police precincts in New York City, we simply do not have the resources afforded to the crossroads of the world to safely handle the hundreds of thousands of tourists that come in charter buses, vans, or cars every December to Diker Heights. NYPD maintain that charter buses are exempt from NYC DOT rules and therefore can traverse local residential streets with sugar plum impunity. While the vast majority of residents and private homeowners still love the lights and cherish their tradition, it is the sheer volume of visitors that overwhelm their small residential neighborhood that exhausts them. Some say they feel like prisoners in their own homes and have to schedule their daily lives around the tour buses and tourists who are not always mindful or respectful of private property and driveways. Others complain of being literally choked by ice cream trucks at idle for 10 hours a day, seven days a week outside their house. The 2018 Diker lights were bigger than ever. What did we learn? For one, we cannot have giant tour buses snarled in these residential areas creating insane gridlock and blocking any chance of an emergency vehicle getting through. We also cannot have ice cream trucks idling for 10 hours a day and illegal vendors turning Diker Heights into Times Square. This bill we're hearing today would put in place a protected zone encompassing the central area of the Diker lights that would bar vending during the Diker light season. By barring vending, we would eliminate food trucks from idling nonstop in front of people's homes and reduce mountains of trash that goes all over the streets, as well as stabilize traffic and safety for pedestrians as there will be less double parked and illegally parked vending trucks. It's fantastic that hundreds of thousands of tourists want to come see Diker lights, but at what cost to the residents who live in this great community the other 365 days a year? It is completely unfair to them. First and foremost, it is our job as elected officials to care about the residents of this city and keep them happy and safe. Hopefully, this bill will make sure that 2019 is different. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. I would like, now to, I would like to call up the first panel. We have Ellen Canfield, Mayor's Office Citywide Event Coordination Management. Managing Attorney Michael Clark, NYPD, Captain Robert Conwell from NYPD. Uh, may you please raise your right hand so that we can administer the oath before you testify. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Thank right. you. Thank you. You may now begin your testimony. Just please state your name for the record. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, hitch the red, a little bit. red button on the mic. Yep. There we go. Good morning, Chairman Espinal, Councilmember Brannon, and other members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. My name is Ellen Canfield. I'm the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Citywide Event Coordination and Management. Thank you so much for having us this morning. As you mentioned, Chairman, I'm joined this morning by Captain Robert Conwell of the 68th Precinct in Brooklyn, which covers Decker Heights. I'm here to testify this morning on behalf of Intro 1657, to prohibit street vending on certain streets in Diker Heights in Brooklyn beginning on Thanksgiving Day until New Year's Day. I'll start by explaining a bit about the mission and operations of Citywide Event Coordination and Management, which I'll refer to as CECM, and our involvement in this neighborhood. CECM provides oversight and interagency coordination for events and activities taking place in streets, plazas, and other public spaces throughout the city. This includes coordination and oversight of procedures and operations in relation to event permitting and operations. CCM also encompasses the Street Activity Permit Office, SAPO, not SAPO as some of you like to call us, which issues permits for street festivals, block parties, farmer, farmers markets, commercial and promotional events, and other activities on streets, sidewalks, and pedestrian plazas. In addition to coordination and permitting, we play a primary role in communication with residents, community boards, and other community-based organizations with the intent of ensuring that public events are safe, properly permitted, and in the best interest of all. The display of holiday decorations in Diker Heights is a local tradition that over the years has become a highly popular attraction for New York City residents as well as local and international tourists. 
Many homeowners put these decorations up the week after Thanksgiving, and they remain up until New Year's Day. The prime viewing area for these lights is on 83rd and 84th Streets from 11th to 13th Avenues in Diker Heights, Brooklyn. The lights, as they are commonly referred to, are now advertised by tour operators and receive a significant amount of media attention. Viewing the lights has become a prominent public event throughout the holiday season, with thousands of residents touring the neighborhood at peak times. As the crowds have grown, residents and community members have raised a number of valid concerns stemming from, from traffic and pedestrian congestion. Primary among these concerns is an increased presence of mobile food vendors, which further exacerbate crowding and have resulted in the following conditions. Crosswalks, driveways, and fire hydrants being blocked by the trucks themselves and by the queues and crowds they create. Residents have observed ambulances being delayed in reaching homes and are concerned that fire trucks and other emergency vehicles may be delayed. Residents being blocked from entering their homes. Mobile food vendors idling for hours, emitting bothersome and dangerous exhaust fumes. Venting taking place in already prohibited areas, including private driveways and front lawns, and pile up of trash and food waste. In 2017, Community Board 10 and the Diker Heights Civic Association pursued conversations with CCM to explore if a SAPO permit could be granted for this community activity, giving the Community Board and the Diker Heights Civic Association greater purview in managing activities. However, SAPO rules are not designed to address activities on private property. In 2018, Community Board 10 and Councilmember Brannon's office hosted a series of meetings for which CECM support was requested to coordinate relevant city agencies to address non-SAPO permit mechanisms for addressing concerns. The meetings focused on vending, public safety, and traffic control. In coordination with the council member and local community board, CECM organized a task force consisting of the following agencies that provide permitting and enforcement of vending activity. NYPD, Department of Sanitation, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Environmental Affairs, and the Department of Consumer Affairs. The objective of the task force was to examine concerns raised by the community and to issue violations to vendors where appropriate. A full inspection was completed on Saturday, December 22, 2018, resulting in violations being issued to a number of mobile food vendors by relevant agencies. However, significant vending activity continued to take place, and the stated concerns persisted. In conclusion, CECM supports the goals of Intro 1657 and believes that it will aid in allevi alleviating some of the safety and quality of life issues raised by community members and observed by CECM in our several years of involvement with the Diker Heights Lights. CECM looks forward to our working partnership with continuing our working partnership with Councilmember Brannon, Community Board 10, and the Diker Heights Civic Association, and all of our partner agencies to ensure that the Diker Heights lights can be a safe and enjoyable activity for all. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you so much. Thank you. I just have one question. Um, with 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 the time uh, with with the work that the city has done to address the issues in that area, is there a number of violations that have been given? So the violations differ by agency because my office and agency is not a violation giving office, and we don't have an enforcement mechanism. I can't speak to you know a specific number given by our office, but there certainly have been violations given by the various enforcement agencies over the past years. We can certainly follow up or ask, ask to get those specific numbers, but I can't testify to the specific agency's violations. Any challenges that the NYPD might have had uh, with enforcement in the area? Captain, do you want to speak to that and I can tag on a bit? Yes, uh, so the NYPD issued a, a handful of violations last year uh, to uh, vending. Uh, the majority of those uh, violations were oath summonses, some were parking summonses, and uh, they were really in regards to distances. Uh, so we found early on uh, that the same uh, four food trucks that were there were licensed. So they were licensed and their trucks were properly licensed, but the violations we issued early on uh, dealt with distances from driveways, uh, fire hydrants, crosswalks, and, and front homes. Once we started issuing those summonses, 
what the vendors did then was find places where they were not in violation of, of those laws. In, has there been instances where homeowners might have been vi given a violation because of, for example, trash that was left behind? <clears throat> well, there was, uh, so throughout the last year's event, uh, primarily one homeowner was selling, uh, he built a stand on his property and was selling, uh, I believe it was primarily hot chocolate most nights. Um, we don't, the legal bureau and the NYPD has advised us that we do not enforce, uh, NYPD cannot enforce vending rules on private property. Thank you. Councilor Brennan? Yeah. Um, as far as um, SAPO is concerned, do you feel, and I guess and a question for NYPD Legal too, do you feel that this bill would give you the tools that you need to, to make this work? I mean, I, I guess that, like, I think some of the stuff that we're trying to correct the, there's a gray area whether or not this was even legal in the first place, right? So we're trying to really zero in on that to, you know, um, in a very specific area, obviously. Um, I, and I guess it's more for NYPD legal, but do you feel that if this bill is passed, um, it will give the cops the tools they need to enforce what we're looking to enforce? Well, I mean, in terms of SAPO, I don't think this bill would change the calculus around SAPO because the SAPO requires some on-street uh, activity, which isn't happening on, on the Decker Light Heights event. I do think, and, you know, Captain Conwell can correct me if I'm wrong, or that... Yeah, look, if, if the bill makes it illegal to vend in that area, absolutely, 100% it'll help us enforce that. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think just more broadly with, with food vending, I think an issue um, that, that, that we've always struggled with, a frustration we have is if a food truck, is, we, just had a, we just had an incident that we, we took care of that where a coffee cart set up outside of school um, and we couldn't tell if it was school property or parks property. It was a lot of gray area. But the issue that we have is that um, when a resident or someone thinks that a food vendor might be out of order or breaking the law, it touches so many different agencies that sometimes whoever responds to it, whether not just the cops, whether it's DOH goes out there or FDNY, whoever it is, it's hard to figure out what laws they're breaking and who can enforce those laws and who can write a ticket for them. I mean, has there been any discussion around trying to consolidate that a little bit? Would you like me to take that, Michael? Sure. I can't speak. Again, yeah, I know that's to, not really. Yeah, your, vending, yeah. vending legislation. So I, Council Member, I think that's a really valid question, and I can echo um, your observations and what I've observed right. at Decker Heights and in other in other areas that the the degree of different agencies who are involved in the enforcement and permitting for the food vendors is part of what makes it extremely difficult to move them, particularly in real time during a congested activity such as the lights. And, and I think there is a multi-agency, at least around the lights effort that your office is leading to address all these issues, not just vending, but traffic and the fumes and making sure this is, you know, the NYPD's primary goal is safety of sure. all the people who are there, the 150,000 people getting them in and out and safely. So there's a multi-agency effort around this. And I understand vending in general is very complicated outside of this event. Um, and I know I... Yeah, I just think it speaks to, I mean, for us, it's for me, it speaks to a larger issue of, of sort of figuring out, you know, there's so many different entry points. And sometimes the cops are called and they don't know you know, the, the law about how close a vendor needs to be from a fire hydrant or how close they need to be from the nearest whatever it is. Um, and some of that is what's happening here, right? I mean, some of the stuff, the laws are already on the books, but Department of Health goes out there and they don't see anything wrong. But then FDNY goes out there and they do, you know. So um, I think it's something to look at maybe to consolidate this stuff so that there's one sort of bill of rights for these guys so they know what's wrong and what's right. But that also when the agencies go out there, they all know what to what to be looking for when a vendor is you know illegally placed somewhere, whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean that seems like a, a much larger conversation to have in a, a citywide yeah right on venue versus then yeah. the specific issue. But 
Yeah, right. It just the, the it's just because for this there. this bill was sort of born out of the fact of the frustration that it seemed like these guys were already doing they were already vending illegally. But in order to actually get something done, we had to write a bill that only encompasses four blocks, right? It wasn't that – it was pretty clear. I mean, we got tickets written from PD and Department of Health was out there too. So clearly they knew that these guys were, were, were illegal enough that they were getting tickets. But like, like the captain said, from our standpoint, they were at early on – vending illegally not that they were illegal vendors that they were set up in the wrong locations but once we gave them citations they moved to correct locations within the law um so after that point they were vending legally um as far as we're no i mean they they weren't in the residential areas they definitely weren't that was that's the problem anyway i'm not i'm not looking to you know do an autopsy here on it but i'm, I'm just hoping that this you know we're doing this bill for a reason so we're hoping that it's going to give um the police, the tools that they need to get this done, because it's honestly, it felt last year like their hands were tied. They wanted, they knew what to do. They they wanted to do the right thing, but they couldn't, you know, because other agencies were telling them no, they're okay. We had a guy from the Department of Health out there telling them, you know, uh, no, actually he's allowed there. And other guys saying he's not. Like no one knew what the rules were, and it was it was very uh, very frustrating. So hopefully, this bill will will fix that. Councilmember Cool. Hi. Um, my question is: uh, Are veterans exempted from this uh, bill, from the from from the, from the enforcement? Because usually veterans they can win uh, uh, most of the places, you know. Right. Right. I would I would think the veterans uh, they have their uh, ability to vent through state law, and they would be exempted. By, by city reg regulations. So what happens if they go there? So you cannot enforce the law, right? To them. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, I th think there would be other regulations we can enforce against them, but the general ban that this bill would, would contemplate wouldn't apply to veterans. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for testifying. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate it. You're free to go. All right. Up next, we have Barbara Vellucci from the Friend Vela Marone Diker Heights Civic Association, Lori Willis, Chair of Community Board 10, and Josephine Beckman, Community Board 10. Thank you. Just take a seat and uh, make sure the red button's on and, te and uh, state your name for the record before we testify. Good morning. I'm, my name is Barbara Vellucci. I am on the executive board of Community Board 10 and of Diker Heights Civic Association. So today, I um, give the testimony uh, on behalf of Fran Vela Marone, the president of Diker Heights Civic Association. Fran and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the committee for holding this hearing regarding intro number 1657. We also thank Councilman Justin Brennan for sponsoring it. The Diker Heights community has a long tradition of celebrating the Christmas season with outstanding Christmas displays that have become world renowned. So much so that during the time between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day, the neighborhood has earned the moniker Diker Lights. As magnificent and magical as this time can be, it has also become a congested and sometimes dangerous environment for the residents as well as those who come to take in the displays. Each year, the displays draw thousands of people, including those arriving via tour buses. We need to remember that this area is a residential community and not a, an amusement park. As the popularity of the displays have grown, so have the problems. 
The Dyka Heights Civic Association has worked closely with Community Board 10 to try to address the issues facing the event and such problems such as traffic, traffic congestion, sanitation, and overall safety. We have tried with the assistance of the NYPD and the local elected officials to balance the concerns of the residents with the safety of the visitors. It must be understood that this is an organic event occurring as a result of homeowners expressing their faith and joy for the season that has turned into a full-blown New York City event, marketed throughout the city, the nation, and around the world. It is not being marketed by the community itself, but rather outside entities. However, because New York City does not recognize Diker Lights as an actual event under the permitting process, it has become more and more difficult to manage and has caused a tremendous strain on this community. By eliminating vendors in the affected area beginning on Thanksgiving Day until New Year's Day, intro number 1657 will have a great impact on improving conditions. Vending has, has an overwhelming negative impact by creating choke points on sidewalks and streets, as well as litter, air, and noise pollution. The presence of vendors produces a commercial-like atmosphere that does not belong in a residential community. Creating a vendor-free zone will alleviate many of the problems plaguing the event. It will give the NYPD the opportunity to focus on a traffic plan that will keep attendees moving along as they simply view the displays. It will also help to keep the area clean. On behalf of the members of the Dyke Heights Civic Association and the Dyke Heights community, Fran, I ask that the community positively consider intro number 1657 and that the full council vote to make it law. I, as in Fran, would also impress upon you the expediency that it is desired to in order that this measure be in effect for the upcoming season. It is our hope that the Dyka Heights Christmas displays will be safe and enjoyable for all. Again, thank you for your consideration. Good morning, Chair Espinal, um, Councilman Brannon, and members of the committee. My name is Josephine Beckman, and I am the District Manager of Community Board 10. I want to first thank the committee for holding this hearing today on Intro 1657. I am happy to be here to testify in support and grateful to Council Member Justin Brannon for his hard work on this intro and all the efforts to improve street safety conditions during the Diker Heights Christmas light display season, locally known as Diker Lights. Dyker Lights, as, as uh, everyone has said, is an organic street event that draws thousands of tourists and local residents to about a 15 block radius in Dyker Heights, Brooklyn. Its tree-lined streets with narrow sidewalks are easily filled to the curb with families and tourists who come to gaze at the magnificent Christmas light displays affixed to residential homes. This begins the day after Thanksgiving and continues through about January 2nd. It has been a local tradition for many decades. But in the last few years, it has grown to overwhelm this local residential neighborhood. These residents have sought help from government with crowd control and safety. Um, the director of CECM spoke about how the board reached out for assistance. Because this tourism boom is really the result of growing social media publicity, news media, I think every day on Channel 5 News it's, it's announced, charter tour buses that begin advertising in September, NYC Go, Manhattan hotels in nearby states have created a must-see buzz. In recent years, food vendor trucks and general vendors transformed this once local light display into the feel of a commercialized street festival, which it is not. Last year, frustrated residents and community leaders reached out once again to our local city council member, Justin Brannon, to secure additional city resources to aid in pedestrian and vehicular safety and crowd control. He was able to advocate for additional police resources for traffic control. In addition, a charter bus diversion plan to nearby 86th Street to unload passengers requires police officers to direct traffic and work to keep pedestrians and tourists safe. 
But feedback from the 2018-19 season included calls for increased traffic control and pleas to address the problems caused by vendors who continue to commercialize this unpermitted event, organic event. The vendors idle in front of homes for 12 hours per day for the 40-day duration, spewing fumes into neighboring homes, making noise on weekdays and weekends. The ice cream trucks with generators create choke points, forcing pedestrians into the street. I have photos that show blocked intersections, illegally parked ice cream trucks, and one resident submitted a video to our office of the fire department who had to walk to a call because they could not get through the intersection. It is our hope that the ban of vendors from the prime viewing area, which entails the very concentrated area of 81st to 86th streets, 10th to 13th Avenue, will improve pedestrian safety, reduce noise and fumes impacting local homes, and remove the street festival fear, feel to this organic local event. Thank you. Thank you. I do have photos I'll, I'll give to the Sergeant Arms later. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Lori Willis. I would like to uh, thank Justin Brannan, um, who has worked with Community Board 10 on this issue, and also for the council for hearing me today. I am the chair of Community Board 10 in Brooklyn. Um, throughout 2017, 2018, I was the vice chair and also the chair of the Police and Public Safety Committee. Um, so Community Board 10 has had many discussions, uh, votes, meetings, interagency meetings um, with the poli police department, Captain Conwell, um, Councilman Brannon on this issue. Um, and this has continued to be an acute recurring problem for our district. Um, I don't want to repeat what everyone else has said, but this collective um, display, a neighborhood display of lights and decorations has created an atmosphere akin to an unpermitted street fair, which goes on uh, um, virtually all day for a little bit over a month in this um, narrow area of a residential district. Um, these, I just want to note that the vendors that are that are vending here are not typical vendors, uh, the type of which may provide, um, you know, food services in an area which may be underserved. The residents report that the vendors are serving hot chocolate, popcorn, cotton candy, uh, little lights and trinkets, holiday balloons, things of this nature. Um, they are setting up on sidewalks, in driveways, um, taking up residents in the streets, consuming parking spaces during the day because they, they vie um, for spots, so they try to stay there throughout the duration if they can. Um, you know, if, if enforcement doesn't chase them away, they've taken up residents there uh, in effect. Um, these are things that I have heard from people who have come to the community board. Um, the residents do not know how to enforce this. They've reached out to us and the very various agencies. Um, as Councilman Brown has pointed out, there's confusion as to what is legal, what is illegal, confusion as to um, whether or not they have to display a license. And if they do, oftentimes enforcement is unclear as to whether or not the type of license they have, um, which uh, from what I've been told is rare, um, is permitted at these times in these areas, et cetera. Um, I had, uh, there are, uh, the effect upon the quality of life of these residents, I don't really want to get into what everyone else has repeated, but I will just recount a few items that have not been mentioned. Um, with regard to the fumes, these are diesel fumes from trucks which are operating from, for hours and hours. The main congestion occurs um, pretty much around sundown, which, you know, at this time of year can be as early as 4.30 p.m., and the trucks run until whatever time the viewers leave. And so this could go into the wee hours, especially on the weekends. These people, I had, had a very disturbing account from a resident who had asthma who could not escape the fumes. He said, I had nowhere to go. I was in my own home choking. Um, the noise and the vibrations from these trucks running all night disturb people. Um, people, when they come home from work, cannot, after a long day of work, they cannot get down their blocks to get to their houses. When they have holiday celebrations with their family, their family members have to get either, you know, get out of their lift or their ride or whatever public transportation they've taken. Uh, this is not an area that is heavily served by public transportation. Blocks and blocks away where elderly, they say my elderly relatives can't come for a holiday meal because we can't get into our area. Um, there is garbage and litter all over. Um, 
because they're in, we're not outfitted with receptacles to accommodate this type of traffic. And fights between vendors have broken out on numerous occasions, residents tell me, because they are vying um, to market here. And the um, Effective enforcement, I know that the efforts have been made, as we said, there have been many meetings, but they are unfelt. There has been no palpable um, effect, and, and the, the residents have, seen, have, have experienced very, very little recourse. Um, I believe that um, this is a smart, simple, narrowly tailored piece of legislation that will go a very long way to address these, not only the quality of life issues, but the safety issues. Um, as, as District Manager Beckman pointed out, she has photographs. Emergency response and police cannot get down these streets. It will make it safer for all, for all people who are there. And the huge number of visitors, if you look at this street, it is packed. It looks like, you know, the San Gennaro Feast. So it is a huge safety issue. and I. And I have been told by the residents that the congestion caused by the vendors who are seemingly um, unregulated will go a very long way to increase the safety and their quality of life. And I thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you so much for testifying. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I just want to assure you that Justin's doing everything he can to get this bill passed. We actually um, put this bill on the agenda as early as we can so that we can get into effect before this holiday season. Uh, any of my colleagues have any questions? Justin. Um, Josephine, what, what, what was the biggest issue? Um, I, I don't know if it, it relates to, to SAPO, obviously, as I was saying before, but I know last year um, one of the issues was that some of these vendors had they, they had permits, but they weren't citywide permits, Correct. right? But but the, the issue there was that DOH was having trouble delineating if they were allowed to be there, or what was well, the Well, it was difficult to get DOH to come out because um, they have limited inspectors. So I think there was, as Ellen said, there was one on, one date on December 22nd, you know, about 23 days into the yeah. event. And several of the vendors had restricted permits, meaning they had licenses, but those licenses limited the areas where they could vend. And they could not vend unless there was a street permitted event, which we know that there wasn't here. So the police department legal division um, spoke with the Department of Health because they were even unclear about it. Um, and they told us that those vendor trucks were licensed and legal to be there when Department of Health told us no, they were not. So for all of those days, three of the trucks had restricted, and I have copies of the, uh, the permit, Permits, they were restricted to only operate in street events where you know they they were able to vend. There was one citywide a citywide vendor permit could be anywhere. Um, so there were several trucks that were there that were idling for all those hours that were not permitted to be there. And that came out following the event when we had the follow up meeting that Ellen helped coordinate for us. And it was at that meeting that Department of Health said no. They should have not been there. Those types of permits are not permitted. So again, it's that ambiguity. It's, it's yeah. amongst agencies, and, and they're not familiar with the rules, um, and they vary across uh, different agencies. We also have the Department of Environmental Protection also has limited numbers of inspectors to go out. They issued violations for fume, but on one day, when you know the residents had to experience these fumes in their homes for the duration of, of the Dyco lights displays. And has... Um has, has PD done a good job with keeping the buses primarily on 86th Street and not turning into the residential area? Yes, I would say yes. For the large tour buses, they have a, a very good system, but yet there are a few that slip, that's, by. That slip by. I mean, it's very labor intensive. Um, you know, I think the detail last year had about 10 to 12 officers and auxiliaries to complement um, their efforts, and, and still um, it was very, very you know difficult. And now we have commuter vans in addition to the sh large tour buses and the commuter vans don't have to adhere to the 86th Street um, rule. So they're traversing the streets and, and making it very difficult. It's very labor intensive for PD to, um, to, to do crowd control. And, and what we've always heard from the city is that there's nothing we really can do as far as these buses are concerned. Correct. Right. Because they're, um, they're chartered buses and they're permitted to be on residential streets. Okay. I'm good, Chair. Thank Great. you. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks for testifying. Thank you. Uh, with that said, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.